Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's fascinating to watch a top chef dice onions or peppers at 100 miles per hour. It's amazing to see how precise hand control someone can have when sewing or doing woodwork or even playing sports. And kids can sometimes do some pretty impressive things with their hands, too. For instance, uh, Elisha knows what to do with his hands. He was very proud of this that he made. Our hands can do some amazing things. And our message for today is about hands, and so as well is our gospel lesson. It's about a man with a withered hand. Now imagine doing your whole life with one hand tied behind your back, right? That's essentially what this man had to do. How could you, for today, drive or use a phone or eat or show affection for another human being? It would be hard enough for us to do that today, even with all our technological advances, but think back to living in an agricultural-based society. I mean, there's no way with one hand you could take care of land, you couldn't even like dig with a shovel. And there were practically no jobs available to a man who had only one hand. Even if there was a job you technically could do, well, you can rest assured that a guy with two hands could do it much better and much faster than he could. And how about his Life, love life, for that matter. I mean, what woman looking out, especially in that day, for the good of her own life and her future children would squander her life on a man with no prospects who could not provide very well for them? It's possible, we don't really know the backstory of this man, that maybe he had developed this later in life. Um, and, but if he had, his name might have been Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, because if he had a wife, he couldn't keep her. The guy certainly couldn't even support himself, much less a family. Uh, those of you who have been laid up with an injury or sickness or perhaps quarantine can perhaps begin to appreciate this man's burden. He felt the pinch, probably, of hospital fees and of lost job income. He had hardly any purpose at all. Again, I think most of us felt a little bit of that kind of during, even during when we had to do shutdown. And just imagine if he really, truly couldn't do barely anything. I mean, he probably the only thing he practically could do was beg to get enough to get by from day to day, living from hand to mouth, only he was doing it at a disadvantage with only one hand to get to his mouth. Well, we can see Jesus' policy on charity here, which, um, did, which I think is an interesting one. Don't give him a hand out. Don't give him a hand up. Just give him a new hand. Uh, Jesus has compassion when he sees this man. And he told this man, stretch out your hand. Now, that was exactly the problem, right? He's got a withered hand. He can't stretch it out. It's, it's almost insulting for Jesus to say, stretch out your hand. But since this is, well, Jesus and not Jeffrey or Jimbo talking, when he says it, it works. The guy does it, surprising himself probably more than anyone else. But you know who wasn't surprised? Some in the crowds. That they'd anticipated this happening, looking forward to it, planning for it. But it was not because they had great faith. Rather, it was with a withered soul and twisted thoughts that they watched Jesus heal this man, and inwardly they rejoiced. They rejoiced inside, but on the outside, they scowled. They rejoiced because now... They could get Jesus in trouble. Oh, you worked on the Sabbath. You're going to be in trouble. Uh, Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. Now, in the actual Old Testament, it's not really illegal to heal on the Sabbath. God never said that. But in the zealous and uh, zealous nature of the Pharisees, they, described, they had developed a tradition of the elders 
a tradition that the Pharisees were now subscribing to in the most part. And in that definition, healing or a doctor doing work was verboten on Sabbath day. Now, Jesus was trending on Twitter at the time. He was becoming very popular, and some people didn't like that. You see, the important folks didn't want competition. Or maybe it was because Jesus told them to repent. Perhaps it was because he was just so outside the norms, or his kindness, or maybe his ability to look into the human heart offended them, or perhaps scared them. To the liberals, his back to the fundamentals and back to the Bible theology was making them uncomfortable and leery. To the conservatives, it might have been his radical challenges to the way things were done that made them nervous and angry. The opponents of Jesus, for whatever reason, wanted him destroyed and discredited. It says that in our gospel lesson, and it says it even earlier in Mark's gospel. And they think... Right? They think that if Jesus loses his popularity, he will lose his power, and he will no longer be a threat. Of course, they're wrong. Uh, Jesus' mission of salvation was not to cater to the people's whims or the latest trends. He didn't let what people thought of him stop him from carrying out his mission. And what was his mission? Well, part of it was, Jesus said, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And elsewhere, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The question for us today is, is your attitude more like Christ's? Or more like these opportunistic opponents of Jesus? My wife and I just watched a movie on, on Apple TV, Boy State, and it was kind of, it was very fitting. It was about um, these boys who were going to uh, kind of a fake election and a, all the process that was involved. And it was sort of, uh, I mean, it was enlightening, but part of it was kind of a little, you know, frightening or sobering because all the things they were doing were the same kinds of things politicians do. And they were very opportunistic. Um, we've seen much going on. Of course, we're in the middle of the highest, you know, the, the most, the last 30 days or whatever of the most political time in America's four-year cycle. And I think it's particularly pertinent that we ask these questions. Do you care about the world around you, the suffering and the death? Or do you, are you just eager to see something go wrong so you can say, I told you, or ha ha, look how he failed, or look how she failed, or look how they failed. Sometimes we act like Jesus' opponents, don't we? When we don't care about people, we just want to see some people fail. Politics often end up like that. This is no exception. Uh, most people aren't really ready to listen, or maybe that's a little cynical, but that's what it feels like. Most people aren't really ready to listen, but they are ready to argue with you, right? What we often want to know is, whose side are you on anyway? Are you on my side, or are you one of the bad guys? And if you don't think like me, I'm just going to try to prove you wrong, rather than trying to figure out why you see things differently than I do. Now, in sports, you know, usually you don't cheer for failure. Yeah, you failed, great job, particularly when you're on the same team. Yet sometimes we find ourselves cheering for, you know, nowadays, the other party, whatever that means, to fail. It's sort of frustrating how many political ads out there are not talking, are talking primarily about what the other guys did wrong and not about what they're going to do right. Sometimes it's not just about uh, issue or policy, which is good to have, you know, we should be trying to pursue the right sorts of policies and the right sorts of actions, but often it turns into or descends into cheering for people to fail. Instead of empathizing or caring for those who are hurt or damaged, 
We instead rejoice inside if things are going badly for those who we oppose. Instead of rejoicing at good news, when the other side does something good or something goes well, we grumble and try to find something wrong with it, to spin it, spin it to reflect negatively for those we disagree with. And it certainly is not just one side that does this. It ain't just the crowds that sometimes cheer for failure and weep at success. Sometimes we do the same with individuals too, don't we? Those at work or those who we disagree with, and we secretly rejoice when something goes wrong for them. Serves them right. They, they got what they had coming, right? Again, we are often, our hearts, if not our words, our actions are often hurtful and not helpful. We all need to be healed of our withered souls so that our hands can be more like our Savior's and heal instead of hurt. We need less pointing of fingers and talking behind our hands and more hands that are looking to help. Working together, as they say, make many hands, make light work. So how do we use our hands? Well, take Jesus' advice. Take exactly what he said to this man and stretch out your hand. You see, we don't have to keep our hands all to ourselves, shriveled up so that the only people we help are those closest to us, or in worst case scenario, only ourselves. Jesus tells us to stretch out your hand. But I can't, you say. I, I've got to take care of me and my own. If I don't fight tooth and nail, I'll lose. If I don't hold on to my possessions and with a tight fist, why, I'll lose all that I've got. To which Jesus might reply, forever would save their life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will find it. You won't know what you'll, that what you'll lose is far less than what you will gain until you stretch out your hand and let go of your stuff, let go of your plans. You see, you can't receive God's good plans for you until you drop whatever it is that you're holding on to. Then and only then will you begin to receive from your heavenly Father all that you need, and you will find yourself uh, more blessed than you could have ever hoped. So our focus this week in is to let's stretch out our hands, not just to some or not just to those we like, but to all that we can manage to. Now, you may not be able to, particularly not without the help of Jesus, but since Jesus tells us to, just as Jesus told this man to do the impossible, and he did, we find that if we pay attention to Jesus, we'll, do, we'll end up doing what we thought was impossible, helping in ways perhaps that we didn't think we were capable of or qualified for, talking to people that we once cheered against, perhaps showing some skin to those with a different skin tone than are ours. May our hands reflect the compassion of the nail-marked hands of our Savior. And that's the challenge for this week is to use your hands for healing and for helping. That could mean a variety of things as it talk typically does, but as the old saying goes, Talk is cheap, right? We hear a lot of talk these days. But today, this week, instead of talking about what the world should be like, go do it. Maybe that means building something for someone else. Maybe it means comforting a family member. Maybe it means stepping out and, and reaching out in a way that you've been thinking about or too nervous or unsure about. Maybe the Lord has put something good and wholesome or healing on, on your heart, and it's just time to take a step in that direction. Talk is cheap, so step out and get hands-on in this world. And with Jesus' help, we will make the world at least a little better place.
because we too have been sent as the hands and feet of Jesus. So heal and restore. That's what a Christian's hands are for. In Jesus' name, amen.